Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, welcome, welcome today at the webinar of the European Society of Gynecology. Uh, today is uh, a particular occasion because uh, uh, Professor Andrei Milevich from Wroclaw and myself who will be the two speakers of that session dedicated to a new term, a new uh, topic, which is the role of juvenile hormones. And then Andrei will explain to you what they are called the juvenile hormones in women from adolescence to old age. As uh, normally, we will have uh, two speakers. First, uh, Professor Milevich uh, will speak, and then I will speak. And then after that, we will have the general discussion. I remind you to write your question in the question and answer, and then uh, we will uh, and then uh, we will uh, answer to all your questions. I will introduce the question to Professor Milevich and the question for me. First, I will, would like to introduce uh, uh, who is our first speaker. Andrei Milevich is professor of medicine and endocrinology in the University of Medicine in Wroclaw and in Poland, and a member also of the Karkonosche College Jelenia Gora. He has been invited speaker in several European and international congresses in endocrinology and gynecology, as well as speaker in the European Fertility Society and European Society of Endocrinology and the International Society of Gynecological and Endocrinology courses. Is member of the board of the Polish Endocrine Society, of the Polish Gynecological Endocrinology Society, of the European Gynecology uh, Society as treasurer, and is member of the board of the International Gynecological Endocrinology Society, honorary member in scientific societies of the honorary member of the European Endocrine Society and Polish Gynecological Endocrinology Society. It also uh, participate to the Czech Endocrine Society, to the Slovak Endocrine Society, to Ukrainian Endocrine Society, member in the board in several journals, in International Gynecological Endocrinology, in European Obstetrics and Gynecology, and in the Polish Endocrinology, and in Endocrine. And uh, today he will uh, speak about uh, the juvenile hormones uh, from adolescence, uh, to the to the uh, to the climate to the beginning of climaterium. Andre, you have the microphone. Please share your screen and then start your uh, your uh, beautiful lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning, uh, uh, dear friends. So I, I have really pleasure and honor uh, to to join that webinar. Uh, I would like to talk today with you. Uh, about the role of juvenile hormone during adolescent reproductive period of life, as well as in pregnancy. So, uh, 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 the juvenile hormone were discovered by Dr. Vincent Villas Ward in the uh, insect, and its hormone regulate development, reproduction, diapause, and polyphenism in insect. But in human, we're using this. Um, name uh, for uh, such a hormone like melatonin, DHA, uh, growth hormone, estradiol, as well as testosterone, because we observe the maximum peak of secretion during the reproductive age, and then with aging decline. For that reason, so we, we call it, as endocrinologists, juvenile hormone. So um, uh, melatonin is a hormone secreted by enigmatic pineal gland in response to darkness. Hence uh, the name hormone of darkness is very secret. Uh, also has been dubbed the seat of the soul by René Descartes, very famous philosopher. Uh, melatonin was uh, first isolated in 1958 by uh, Dr. Lerner from Yale University School of Medicine. They give the substance its name on the basis of its ability uh, to lighten skin color in frogs by re reversing the skin darkening uh, effect of melanocyte stimulating hormone. Melan melatonin <laughs> is produced from serotonin through a cascade of enzymatic reaction. 
also exert its physiological effect through the specific receptor MT1 and MT2. As you can see uh, on that graph, some melatonin change is at different, totally different levels during the day and during the night. Melatonin is produced mainly at night to reach serum concentration several times higher during the day, as you can see on the graph. The peak secretion was, were observed uh, between midnight and 3 p.m. In human, we produce a small amount of uh, every day uh, of melatonin because only 30 microgram per day. The diurnal rhythm of melatonin secretion appears in human between six and nine weeks of age and fully develops between 21st to 27 weeks of age. And then slowly decline. So um, uh, the peak of uh, nocturnal secretion amplitude occur between five and 10 years, as you can see, the very high peak in, 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 uh, in kids, but with calendar age, this peak is slowly decline. And in aging people, the difference between melatonin during the night and during the day is very negligible. For that reason, it makes sense uh, for pe aging people with uh, sleep disorders to use melatonin uh, because it's help to, to, to find the regular rhythm of sleeping. As you can see, the melatonin uh, levels decrease in children is about 20, uh, 250 milligram per ml. And then in aging people decline to 20 to 30 picogram per ml. So uh, what is the clinical symptom of melatonin deficiency? I must to say that it's a, a little uh, epidemic during our population because of artificial lighting, blue light. We spend too much time front of the computer or to phone screen. And then we can expect it such a symptom like uh, when fa failing sleep or proper sleep pattern, fatigue during the day, deterioration of physical condition, and or neurotic or depressive status. If uh, such a symptom uh, you observe uh, in your patient or in yourself for a long time, so it's necessary to estimate it's the level of melatonin because melatonin treatment can be helpful for you or for your patient. So what we can say about melatonin and puberty? As you can see on that graph, these beautiful graphs which show the fantastic peak of melatonin during early childhood, and then after puberty, decline with our aging process. Melatonin is known to inhibit pubertal onset in normal children. At pubertal time, its level shows sharp decline, 75%, as you can see on that graph. It is believed that, that this decline always is a surge of hypothalamic GnRH and the start of cascade of pubertal changes. Highly differences uh, were also found in day and night and total secretion of melatonin in different tenor stages is very important. And uh, yes, a significant decrease were observed in girls and boys in stages one and two of tenor. But it was during the puberty, they don't observe, the researcher don't observe any correlation between the secretion of melatonin and the serum estradiol, testosterone, LH, FSH, or DHA sulfate levels. What we can expect it in people who uh, have a, a, penal, a penal region tumor, which are very rare, as, 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 uh, as, uh, as I uh, can say, you looking for literature. I can find one paper very interesting, including 21 patients with penal region tumors. And as you can see, eight patients show normal melatonin secretion levels, six cases, as a lack of night maximum plasma value. And seven of these cases show uh, uh, extremely high the levels of melatonin uh, in comparison to healthy population. Um, the author of this publication don't found any correlation between melatonin secretion and histological type of the penile region tumor. 
So it's also a lot of paper according to the uh, relation between melatonin and breast cancer. Several studies suggest that melatonin may influence the growth of breast cancer. Uh, I must say that uh, the study including uh, 74 untreated uh, uh, breast cancer in different stage um, uh, and uh, in comparison to control showed that mesel melatonin were significantly higher in patients with uh, uh, cancer in comparison to control. What was very interesting is that melatonin concentration was were, were higher in breast patient, uh, breast cancer patient with best prognosis. I, I mean, estrogen receptor positive and nodule uh, negative cases. So what we can say about melatonin and pregnancy? So the experts don't recommend melatonin for insomnia, which we can observe in some of the pregnant women. Uh, but uh, according to fertilization, uh, so it's observed success and pregnancy rate were improved by melatonin treatment. This uh, fertilization rate was 50% higher in melatonin treatment cycle compared to the previous melatonin free cycle. It's a very, very, very um, interesting and very important uh, news, a uh, home message. So the second um, uh, uh, juvenile hormone is dehydroepiandrosterone. Dehydroepiandrosterone is produced by zona reticularis uh, in adrenal glands and uh, the DHA and DHL sulfate are not themselves androgen, but it's a instead prohormone and that converted, as you can see on that graph, uh, to testosterone and estradiol and DHA, dehydroepiandrosterone and its sulfate form play really, really important role in our human um, uh, steroidogenesis. You must also remember that DHA and its metabolism act as neurosteroids. It's absolutely uh, very important for that reason. So the people who treat it with uh, DHA have, uh, have uh, uh, observed well, uh, increase their well-being. So this uh, neurosteroids effect is via uh, membrane receptors such as gamma aminobutyric uh, acid alpha or N-methyl aspartate receptor, or also via PIPAR, uh, PIPAR alpha or pregnen uh, X, uh, XXX uh, receptor on androstanol or estrogen receptor beta. So uh, as you can see on that graph, the secretion of DHA is um, present two peaks. The first one during the between fetus and puberty, and then between puberty and in the adult. So um, uh, the peak was observed in adult between 20 and 30 years. And then it declined, as you can see uh, in females, uh, according to uh, it depends of the calendar age, so the levels of DHA decrease. Very important, uh, 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 crucial role play DHA in adrenarchy. Adrenarchy is a physiological condition that usually occurs after five years of age due to the maturation of the adrenal cortex, and it's characterized by the rising of adrenal androgen DHA and DHL sulfate. The clinical manifestation of adrenarchy is called puberty, uh, which <coughs> consists uh, of the appearance of pubic hair, axillary hair, adult body odor, and acne. Puberty is uh, considered premature if it appears before the age of eight years in girls. Uh, the, there are two major forms of premature sexual maturation. The first one is gonadotropin dependent, a central or true through uh, pre 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 precocious puberty, or gonadotropin independent. 70 to 90% of cases of premature puberty simply represent an in anticipation of prepubertal physiological adrenarchy. It is called idiopathic premature puberty or premature adrenarche is characterized by the elevation of DHA sulfate. In the other 10 to 30 
percent of cases. Premature puberty is the first manifestation of non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia due mainly by uh, milt 21 hydroxylase deficiency or uh, adrenal tumor. Premature puberty could also be a manifestation of an increased sensitivity of the hair follicle to normal androgen level. And in these cases, it is generally called isolated premature puberty. In patients with premature adrenarche or isolated premature puberty, st st structure, bone age, and growth velocity are not affected. However, in some cases, was shown significant bone age advancement or growth acceleration. So, uh, according to congenital adrenal hyperplasia, it's, as you know, is a classic form or non classic, a classic is diagnosed in the bird, and non classic typically for during the adolescent. A female with congenital adrenal hyperplasia depends on severity of the uh, enzymatic defect, may have genitalia that appears different from what is expected for girls. Early puberty, depending uh, deepening the voice, short height, acne, excessive facial or body hair, and uh, menstrual irregularity. The most common form of uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, especially non classic, is a 21 hydroxylase deficiency, which we can diagnose uh, uh, estimated 70 hydroxy progesterone if, if it's, uh, the basal level is over 200 nanogram per ml, and bone uh, age is advanced of uh, two year DHA sulfate increase, so that we can recognize to a non classic 21 hydroxylase deficiency. So uh, the other form of congenital adrenal hyperplasia listed here, so are very rare. So adrenal tumor is also one of the cases when we observe elevated uh, the DHA. So um, it's, it's sometimes malignant and sometimes it's uh, benign. Um, however, so we observe Cushing syndrome, the symptom are typically according to the moon phase, round red face, humped and back of neck, purple st st stretch marks, skin changes, uh, rapid weight gain, as well as patient present uh, uh, blood pressure, uh, low uh, high blood pressure, low potassium levels, uh, headache, and uh, very often we observe diabetes. And typical is a central obesity with very thin um, uh, hands and legs. In contrast to excessive amount of DHA, uh, there's a low amount of DHA we observe in uh, adrenal insufficiency. It could be to form primary adrenal insufficiency and secondary uh, <coughs> adrenal deficiency with hypopituitarism result in long-term low or undetectable DHA levels. In contrast, in the isolated gonadal insufficiency, the androgen prohormones are usually normal as the major product of this hormone and is the adrenal gland and peripheral conversion. Hunt and colleagues administer 50 milligram DHA in 24 women with Addison disease. They observe a significant improvement in itself, um, in, in self esteem and fatigue in the evening. However, they um, found no consistent effect of co cognition or sexual erosion or, uh, or function. I must to say that uh, President John Kennedy also have uh, Addison disease and he used uh, 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 DHA for a long time. So uh, if also the administration of the DHA in those to, to 25 milligram, uh, early, uh, uh, so what is very important is the morning in adolescent girl with central ACTH deficiency, increased pubic hair and improve well-being. However, Johnson and coworkers administer a DHA dose 20 milligram or 50 milligram for a six man in open labor cross-design study. 
um, and, and uh, they uh, observe no significant improvement in quality of life and sexual interest of activity. A recent meta-analysis of 10 studies summarized that DHA administration in women with primary or secondary adrenal insufficiency results in only small improvement in quality of life and would, according to depression, but no significant consist consistent effect on anxiety or sexual function. What is very important also is the majority of women, as you, as you know, with Sheehan syndrome, um, suffer from sexual dysfunction. And uh, there was significant improvement in one of that study, what I uh, uh, stated here, in the female sexual function index. Uh, um, they observe as it in, in, the in, in index increase um, the, after 25 milligram of DHA in comparison to placebo. What we can say about uh, DHA infertility? Uh, DHA levels uh, were decreased in second part of uh, uh, in second and third trimester, as you can see here. That's uh, DHL levels during the week of pregnancy on that graph, as you can see, very elegant. And uh, 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 it's uh, play a very important role, or especially in vitro fertilization clinic. 25% of that use by, uh, for, for lady before IVF, um, uh, the DHA supplementation. And there's the best results, as you can see on that graph, um, they receive most of this center if you receive the high levels of uh, DHA. And if the levels of DHA was uh, 1,850 nanogram per ml, then in that group, they observe the, the biggest uh, uh, fantastic result according to clinical pregnancy rate and to life uh, birth rate. Um, DHA was administered in observational study at dose 50 milligram to women with diminished uh, ovarian reserve and premature ovarian insufficiency with some success. So the next uh, growth hormone, as uh, the next uh, juvenile hormone is growth hormone. As you can see, the growth hormone is of course, of course produced uh, by pituitary glands and is several factor which inhibit secretion or stimulate secretion on that graph. So, but uh, uh, also many other uh, uh, factor uh, can influence for uh, horm uh, growth hormone secretion. I mean, age, sex, sleep, week, uh, cycle, sex hormone, feeding, stress, adiposity, and acute and chronic stress. As you can see, it's a totally different uh, uh, profile of growth hormone in young female and young men. Thus, uh, the same you can observe in older female and men. As with aging, um, it, uh, de decline as uh, levels of growth hormone and IGF-1, which play a very important role in the regulation of uh, growth hormone secretion. Growth hormone in adolescence. So uh, uh, Albertson uh, Wickling uh, ob uh, observed for 24 hours growth hormone profile in over 200 healthy children, girls and boys. And what they found? So they found that in prepubertal, that's a prepubertal here, it's a puberty and prepubertal, that's a gross hormone secretion. So in prepubertal, um, uh, uh, during uh, 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 prepubertal boys and girls, as a mean secretion rate were comparable, but increase during the puberty uh, earlier in girl especially at uh, st uh, Tanner stage two, uh, with the highest rates in Tanner stage three and four, and later were uh, observed that were, were this uh, uh, the highest level in stage four in boys, but in both uh, sex, uh, growth hormone secretion decreased to prepubertal value in stage five. It's a very interesting clinical observation. What we can expect it in a case when uh, children uh, have uh, low levels of uh, growth hormone. 
gross hormone deficiency. Gross hormone deficiency can be caused by damage to the pituitary gland or hypothalamus. It can be ha happen later to, to the head injury, brain infection, or brain surgery. The injury can occur before, before birth, um, is a congenital, or during the or after birth is acquired. The clinical syndrome of gross hormone deficiency is characterized by non-specific features, including variable presence of, of decreasing mood and general well-being, reduced bone remodeling activity, change in body fat distribution with increased central adiposity, hyperlipidemia, and increased predisposition or risk of atherogenesis. The kids with, as you can see on that graph, uh, with uh, gross hormone deficiency grow less than normal kids. I mean, they grow uh, less than, than five centimeter per year. So according to the pituitary apoplexy, what's happened also in, uh, in adolescent, because now many girls start to, uh, to, 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 to join the, such a discipline yeah, like box or king boxing or uh, football or uh, motorcycle uh, rally, uh, which creates many dangerous situation, uh, um, uh, finally uh, finishing pituitary apoplexy. If the pituitary gland suffer damage in the region responsible for producing gross hormone, the victim could experience symptom of depression anxiety, lethargy, decreased sex drive, and ex excessive fatigue. The most important uh, symptom of pituitary apoplexy uh, is sudden and severe headache. More than half of people also have vision problem with this headache due to increased pressure of the nerves that run from your brain to your eyes. This may include double vision, dropping eye, a partial or full vision loss in one or both eyes. A rare symptom are noisy or vomiting, sensitivity to light, confusion, fatigue, or fever. So uh, in contrast to, 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 to the, the decline of uh, growth hormone, uh, we observe also many cases with elevated growth hormone. The first one during the adolescence is gigantism. Gigantism is described as accelerated growth uh, during childhood from the production of excessive growth hormone uh, causes by, by a pituitary tumor. Uh, by definition, gigantism must occur during childhood before the growth plate in as a long bone of the body, for example, femur or hemorrhoids, uh, have closed. It's, it's logic. Higher than normal levels of IGF-1 may mean uh, gigantism in children. Children with gigantism uh, grow rapidly in height. Uh, aside from uh, being very tall, large for their age, physical characteristics of a gigantism include very prominent forehead and a prominent jaw. In the uh, uh, adult uh, people uh, as an excessive amount of growth hormone creates as uh, a disease what we call acromegaly. And it develops when pituitary glands release too much growth hormone by tumor into the body over a long period of time. When growth hormone enters the blood, this signaling with liver to, pro to produce another hormone called um, insulin-like growth factor. IGF-1 is a hormone that actually causes bone and body tissue to grow. And as you can see, the face of this young girl with acromegaly changed to the previous status. And several symptom, clinical symptoms can be observed in cases with acromegaly cases, with large lip, nose, uh, mac macrognathia, uh, large hands and feet, skin uh, sicknesses, and headaches, visual changes, menstrual dysfunction, loss of libido. What we can say about gross hormone and pre pregnancy? 
In pregnancy, pituitary growth hormone is gradually replaced by placental growth hormone, as you can see here. Uh, uh, placental growth hormone and this growth hormone it, during the normal, it's like a scissor look. Uh, so uh, levels of placental growth hormone in maternal circulation increase throughout pregnancy from as early as eight weeks of pregnancy with maximum level around the week 35, as you can see here. The pregnancy induced rise in placenta growth hormone levels in the growth hormone deficient patient was comparable to the rise seen during normal pregnancy and uh, was not suppressed by the concurrent human growth hormone treatment. The maternal serum levels of placental uh, uh, growth uh, hormone reflect placental function and fetal growth. As you can see, that's a normal pregnancy, it's IGF-1, uh, uh, placental growth hormone, and this uh, growth hormone, and this acromegaly uh, with pre pregnant woman. It's totally different profile of IGF-1, uh, the what plateau of growth hormone, and increase like in normally uh, pregnancy, uh, uh, placental growth hormone, we observe can be uh, 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 treated to with gross hormone pregnant woman. So I must say that it's no, uh, it's a negligible number of study. Gross hormone therapy has not been studied in pregnant women. However, in animal study, gross hormone has not been shown to cause uh, birth defect of other problems. Gross uh, hormone de deficient pregnant women may take advantage of gross hormone substitution during the pregnancy, but this issue still remains unresolved. The drug should be used during the pregnancy only if clearly needed for life. Uh, 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 so the last but not least uh, juvenile hormone is estradiol in women. Estradiol is produced, of course, by the ovary and adrenal and uh, uh, during pregnancy by placenta. Uh, estradiol level is lower than one picogram per ml usually indicated as a prepubertal stage. Beginning uh, between age 10 to 13, teenage hormone kick in producing physical and emotional uh, changes what you observe in teenager. Bernstein and uh, all found in premenopausal women from United States um, with earlier men are higher serum uh, estradiol level in comparison to Chinese woman with later menarche. The time of menarche decided uh, about the estradiol levels during the adult life. Also very important second point is obesity. And the other study shows that early age of menarche together with adult overweight of obesity result two-fold graded level of estradiol in follicular phase in comparison to women with menarche at age 13 or later. That's a, a, a table show you the levels of estradiol. It depends of tanner stage in young girls, as you can see, change and is, is decline. So uh, uh, estradiol and mood disorders in adolescence. Mood disorders and uh, health risk behavior increase in adolescent puberty is considered to contribute to these events. However, the precise impact of pubertal hormone changes to the emergence uh, of mood disorders and risk behavior is relatively unclear. Three longitudinal and several cross-sectional study indicated potential association between estradiol and certain mood or affective status, especially depression and mood variable, so uh, that are insufficient data to confirm that the rise in estradiol during puberty is causative. Endometriosis, that's the second, uh, the next is the uh, clinical case when we observe uh, elevated levels of estradiol. Endometriosis is predominant and estrogen dependent condition that is mostly commonly diagnosed in women 
who are between 30 and 40 years old. Uh, estradiol, which uh, reaches endometriosis by circulation or is produced uh, locally by endometric tissue, acts as a steroid hormone to regulate growth of this tissue. Estradiol enters cells and bind of estrogen receptor in the responsive cells. Women with endometriosis generally have higher level of estrogen than women without endometriosis. And now cases with low levels of estradiol. So we can observe, of course, in premature ovarian failure. Uh, in, so it's, it's estimated to affect 1% of women under the age of 40 and 0.1% of women under the age 30. The question uh, about the patient menstruation cycle, exposure to, uh, to toxin, such as uh, uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, and previous uh, uh, ovarian surgery are helpful for the diagnosis. A pregnancy test uh, is done uh, in cases to, for response uh, for diagnosis. A serum uh, FSH and Trastadiol level are measured weekly two uh, to four weeks, and FSH level are higher than 20 uh, microunit per ml, but usually uh, higher than 30 microunit per ml, and estradiol level low, usually uh, than 20 picogram per ml, uh, are sufficient to uh, confirm the, uh, um, the diagnosis premature ovarian failure. The next cases, which uh, uh, when we can expect it, uh, lower levels of estradiol, is a hyperplactinemia. Of course, uh, it's a condition of elevated prolactin levels, uh, due mostly by macroplactinoma or microplactinoma. Microplactinoma, of course, is much, much more frequent uh, in comparison to macro and or idiopathic hyperplactinemia. But we must also remember what hypothyroidism uh, as a uh, uh, causes of hyperplactinemia as well as liver uh, and uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, so, so of, of course, hyperplactinemia uh, associated with typical symptom amenorrhea, amenorrhea or uh, galactorrhea in women. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I don't uh, focus now for, for treatment because you know, of course, very well how to do that. Estradiol chart in pregnancy. Estradiol is also thought to play a role in maintaining the pregnancy and rich is currently ongoing into the role of estrogen in initiating labor. In the uh, four to eight weeks of pregnancy, serum estradiol level was positively correlated with positive uh, gestational age. Estradiol levels at early pregnancy can reflect the quality of the domain follicle and the function of corpus luteum, as well as help maintain corpus luteum. During pregnancy, the estradiol level rises because it is also produced by placenta. As you can see, that is the typical um, profile for all hormone during the first, second, and third trimester. Uh, the estradiol is over there and increase, of course, with each uh, trimester of the pregnancy. So uh, it was shown that uh, high maternal serum estradiol levels in the first trimester of pregnancy are associated with high incidence of low birth and small for gestational age. We must remember about that. In pregnant women with twin or multiple elevated tetradiol increase the risk of extreme morning sickness and hyper hyperamazic gravidarum. This condition can lead to dehydration, weight loss, and electrolyte imbalance. During pregnancy, women carry, uh, carry, carrying twins had 58% higher geometric mean estradiol concentration and 50% higher testosterone concentration than women carrying singleton. So uh, in the end of the day, so summarizing my presentation, the melatonin, DHA, growth, uh, hormone, as well as estradiol, a juvenile hormone. The hypo and hypersecretion of that hormone uh, was observed in physiological and pathological situation from puberty till pregnancy in woman life. The juvenile hormone pathologic secretion needs different special therapy or substitution. 
sorry, so it was in American Express uh, at, at the time as uh, this presentation, but it's a huge, uh, big um, material according to that problem. And I hope you find them interesting and can be helpful in your everyday practice. And in the end, that's a symbol of our solidarity with our friends from Ukraine, where they fighting for democracy and we are still remember and thinking about that and cross finger for, for, for Ukraine. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Andre, for the beautiful presentation, and then I will now follow. I will follow with uh, my presentation on juvenile hormones uh, from climacterium to old age. <clears throat> this is uh, something who is done to try to have a more clear interpretation of their possible role. First of all, I would like to start with you from the observation of what happens if you have a sudden loss of one of the most important so-called juvenile hormones, which are the gonadal hormones than estradiol, and after a bilateral ophorectomy with a premature loss of estrogen and uh, uh, also of other ovarian steroids. Certainly, this can also happen by <clears throat> some events touching some environmental risk factor, who are the diet, the physical activity, the smoking, uh, several adverse uh, uh, childhood events or adverse events in reproductive life, event, life, and also environmental toxin, who can affect the ovarian function. Then uh, this is associated with an acceleration of aging processes. This is something of important. Then we have an acceleration in accumulation of senescent cells, in a senescent cell-derived proteins, in inflammation, in protein aggregation, such the brain amyloid or tau in the brain, uh, some mitochondrial dysfunction, some epigenetic alteration, such DNA methylation, some uh, reduction in telomeres, empiric signaling, exhaustion of stem cells, and also other processes. And this bring to the picture of uh, multimorbidity. This is something that uh, is interesting to uh, better understand, which is the multimorbidity. Multimorbidity can touch uh, mental health, for example, with depression, anxiety, substance abuse disorder, sometimes dementia and Alzheimer's disease, uh, or schizophrenia and psychosis, with cardiovascular or metabolic uh, situations, such as hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, arrhythmias, coronary artery diseases, stroke, and so on. And also with other somatic diseases, such as arthritis, cancer, asthma, osteoporosis, chronic kidney disease. And this bring, this multimorbidity, bring to the development of frailty condition with physical functional decline, um, who can touch also the global cognitive function, and this can be terminated with a uh, uh, reduced health span. Then uh, in the female aging, we have different parameters who touch at the same time. One is the menopause, the other is the adrenopause, then the somatopause, and then the melatonin system impairment. Going now to the, uh, to the symptoms of menopause. As you can see here, the symptoms of menopause are associated, they are, they are, some are central symptoms, such as flushes, depression, anxiety, cognitive changes, but also we have skin symptoms, such who are, such reduced skin thickness, reduced elasticity, hydration, increased brightening, but we have also important metabolic changes who are associated to weight changes, such as weight gain and increased visceral adiposity. But at the same time, we have also the musculoskeletal. The musculoskeletal changes are associated to osteoporosis and osteopenia, but also to osteoarthrosis with joint pain and sarcopenia. In the other side, we have symptoms of the urogenital aging, which are so clear from the genital tissues, such as vaginal dryness and vulva reaching 
and burning, but also symptoms of urinary systems, such dysuria, urinary frequency, urgency, and recurrent lower urinary uh, tract infection. And certainly, and one of the major symptoms is the changes in sexual function, because the sexual function is strictly dependent from the effect of hormones, not only on the genital tissues, but also on the brain, with a decrease of sexual desire and dyspareunia. And, uh, okay, when we speak about this symptom, each one of them have a series, uh, they have been strictly and very well characterized by the factors who are the cause. First of all, you have to remind that at the same time of the menopause, with increases in gonadotropin and lack of gonadal steroids, we have also the adrenopause, which is characterized by a reduction of delta-5 androgen, DHEA and DHEA sulfate, and the reduction of also of beta endorphin, while you have a continuous progressive increase of cortisol. And uh, at the same time, but we have also the somatopause that it was described by Professor Milevich with reduction of growth hormone and IGF-1 and reduction also in melatonin production. When you go to see vasomotor symptoms, they have been clarified, they've been uh, clearly uh, established that they are dependent from the increase in central noradrenaline, the reduction in dopamine and serotonin, but also the increases in cortisol, dynorphin, kispeptin, and neurokinin B. And when you go to the symptoms related to the, I'm sorry, to the mood and cognitive function and neuroendocrine activity, if you go in, you can see that they are dependent in the increase in noradrenaline reduction in dopamine and serotonin, but also a reduction in central GABAergic function and reduction in beta endorphin, but allopregnanolone and all androgen androstindione, testosterone, DHEA, DHEA sulfate, reduction of estradiol, increases in cortisol and in beta amyloid. The same is for the urogenital symptom. You can see that in, in urogenital symptom, you have the association as causes of reduction in estrogen, but also the reduction in androgen coming from the adrenal gland. When you go to see the metabolic and cardiovascular changes, it's important to note that in addition to the effect of changing gonadal steroids and changing in, uh, in metabolic factors such as FF, FF, FFA, free fatty acid, low density and cholesterol, changes in leptin, in renin angiotensis system, we have also the effect of the reduction of the somatopole, the reduction in growth hormone and IGF-1 and growth hormone IGF-1 ratio. And the same is when you go to the muscular changes. Muscular changes are certainly dependent from the somatopause and the lack of androgen. And bone remodeling changes is also dependent from the specific, some specific changes in cytokines, but also in the reduction in androgen and the H testosterone and DHEA. And also the skin aging and air changes are dependent from the reduction in estrogen androgen ratio, but also the reduction in testosterone and the hydrotestosterone. Then you can see from that picture that all these changes are the summatory factor of what happened in the uh, pituitary gonadal axis, but also what happened in pituitary adrenal axis, what happened in, uh, some in, uh, adrenal, in uh, pituitary production of GH and liver production of IGF-1 and reduction of melatonin. Then when we speak about the female aging, the menopause, in the menopause, you have climateric, early climateric symptoms, such as flushes, vulvovaginal atrophy, genital urinary syndrome of the menopause, sexual dysfunction, and mood swings and anxiety. But we have also long-term problems that we have to take care, such as pelvic oral prolapse and urinary incontinence, cardiovascular diseases and metabolic syndrome, osteoporosis and fracture, and problem touching cognition and dementia. And all these are characterized by specific changes. For example, hot flushes and sweats, they are depending from the different changes of rising noradrenaline, declining dopamine and beta endorphin in the anterior hypothalamus and in posterior hypothalamus. And concerning the osteoporosis, we have to think about that the estrogen played a major role in the control of the osteoclast and the activation of the osteoblast. But at the same time, when you speak about sarcopenia, because, because also the, 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 all the structure of the bone is something 
but the function of moving is also associated to the importance of the muscular muscles. Muscular muscles are strongly dependent from lifestyle factor and physical inactivity, but also from the reduction of protein intake and vitamin deficiency, and mostly for the reduction of testosterone and the estrogen-androgen ratio. Then you clearly understand how the changes in the so-called juvenile hormone can affect the body in the multiple side. And then I would like now to go with you to the genital urinary symptom according to the menopause. These are the symptoms. I don't will go reading that one, but just to show you what are the estrogen dependent. The estrogen dependent in green are only the epithelium thickness of the vagina, the diminished lubrication, and the increased vaginal pH. All the other are androgen dependent. Then it's clear that the changes in the genital urinary syndrome of the menopause depends certainly from the lack of gonadal estrogen, but also from the lack of gonadal endogen and adrenal endogen. It's also the lack of endogen who touch the second part of the female life who is important in the development of this disease. And when we speak about the pain, uh, you get the recurrent urinary tract infection, the blood their pain syndrome, and the sexual disorder, they're all dependent from this lack of both androgen and estrogen. And also the pelvic floor during aging processes, you can see this is uh, characterized by uh, a concurrent action of pelvic denervation and devascularization who touch the anatomic modification, who bring to a decline in mechanical strength, bringing to a dysenergy pelvic floor, floor function. But this one is strongly dependent from the lack of both estrogen and androgen. And when we speak about pelvic organ prolapse, urinary infection, and sexual dysfunction, it's clear that the sexual dysfunction is strongly dependent from those, all those changes who happen in circulating androgen and estrogen. And another point I would like to focus your attention is the problem of the impact of dementia. You can see that beautiful picture shows the number of people with dementia in low and middle income countries compared to the high income countries. It's terrible the impact in the middle, uh, in the middle and little income countries in comparison to the high income countries. But when you look at the percentage of people with dementia, both males and females, you can see that while there is no so much difference until the 80s. After the 80s, the female have the major increase in, in uh, dementia. And this is uh, demonstrated, and this is also associated by the important changes in the lack of juvenile hormone in, in women. And then I would like to focus more my attention on the role of the adrenopause. Uh, Professor Milevich was mentioning that the adrenal androgen originates from the zona reticularis. And the zona reticularis have the maximum development during the fetal life, then it's immediately decline after birth. It rises again in puberty with an increase in delta 5 androgen production and no modification in other zone. If the peak of reticularis zone activity is around the 20, 30, 30 years, then it declines, and then it's associated with a decline in the endogen production. But endogen are fundamental. In effect, you know, in Adrenarche, you have the beginning, it was mentioned by Professor Milevich, development of sexual hair, libido, bone density, stature, muscle mass, and immune function. But this is exactly the opposite what happened in menopausal senescence. In menopausal senescence, you have exactly the decrease of all these points. And this is depending from the lack of androgen. And in fact, if you see what is the behavior and the pattern of circulating the HEA sulfate in men and women, we have a gender difference as absolute levels, but absolutely no gender difference, no difference in the behavior during the life. We have the progressively declining concentration after our 20, 25 years during all the life, while the major regulator of the adrenal gland, who is cortisol, don't show any, any gender difference, but show a progressive increase during the whole life. And then this is also very important for the negative effect and negative impact that glucocorticoids have on the brain. And if we put together the HEA, the HEA sulfate, and also delta for androgen, testosterone, and androstindion, at 40 years, already the women, they have a 50% reduction. This clearly indicates that they are juvenile. 
juvenile hormones who characterize uh, the uh, sexual behavior of women during that life. And then 10 years before the menopause, they have already lost 50% of all their endogen, and at 70, they're reaching the 80% reduction. And then, you know, this uh, makes uh, that we have an association uh, concerning uh, the effect uh, during the life of uh, higher cortisol, who still will have an effect on gluconeogenesis and stimulate anxiety, depression, cognitive function, negative mood, and negative libido, and uh, aging and menopause with lower estrogen and lower DHEA with lower androgen and lower allopregnanolone also. This is also important. They are not only the change, in this also it was not focused, but also allopregnanolone decreases after menopause and decreases in aging process. And this is a one major part of the changes in central mood. And then I would like to make, to push you to reflect, what is the role of the androgen in menopause? In the endogen menopause, more, even more in, in surgical menopause, you have the reduction of delta-4 androstenedione and testosterone, while in the, uh, in the, uh, at the age of the menopause, we have the already age-related reduction of the HEA and the HEA sulfate. And all these, all these together are causes of the normally observed changes in female sexuality and libido in mood changes and in some individual in development of cognitive pathologies and also negative changes of well-being. I remind you why it is important the HEA, which is in equilibrium through sulfatase and sulfotransferase with the HEA sulfate. It can be dehydrogenase to androstenedione, who can be aromatized to estrone, and then it, the androstenedione can be transformed to testosterone, who can, who can be either <coughs> reduced to dehydrotestosterone by dehydrogenase or aromatized to estradiol. That this means that after the menopause, when the women they have no more steroids coming from the gonads, the DHA remains the only precursor for total, total estrogen and androgen in peripheral circulation. And DHA is not only responsible of what are the circulating concentration of estradiol, testosterone, and so on, but at local level, at tissue level, responsible of the local concentration of both estrogen and androgen. And it's important also to observe that uh, menopause hormone therapy, which is normally associated with a potent increase in allopregnanolone, is associated by all kind of estrogen of menopause hormone therapy. Only tibolone, which is a which is in fact a progestogen with estrogenic metabolite, don't affect the HA. But all the treatment, also the single patch with estradiol, reduces importantly circulating concentration of the HA from 25 to more than 50 percent. This is important to remind because if androgen have an important role to maintain female sexual behavior, when you administer menopause hormone therapy, you uh, you uh, make even stronger the reduction, the endogenous reduction of endogenous DHEA. And DHEA can be, can be aromatized, it can be transformed to endogen and estrogen. In all tissues, no, not in the mammary gland and not in the endometrial tissue. And the mammary gland and, and endometrium, they don't have the enzyme responsible to the transformation of DHEA to estradiol. While they exist in adipose tissue, in skin, in bone, in cardiovascular system, in brain, and also in the vagina. And then I would like to put your attention on another point, the somatopause. Somatopause, somatopause is the association, uh, what happened in the association of growth hormone production from the pituitary and IGF-1 production from the liver. You can see here, this is uh, in premenopausal, perimenopausal, and postmenopausal uh, individual, beautiful paper from Yen in 2004, who shows how the, we have an age-related decline in growth hormone secretion with a decrease of growth hormone secretory amplitude, but not in the frequency. Then it's the amplitude which is reduced. And then uh, this reduction in this uh, amplitude of the growth hormone is uh, in touch all the effect, reduces the effect of IGF-1 from the liver on muscular structure and on the bone and affect also for paracrine action and affect also the adipocyte. 
This is important how estrogen can interfere in growth hormone HF1 axis and menopause. The difference in levels of growth hormone and HF1 between men and women is lost after menopause. Estrogen treatment enhances growth hormone secretion. Acute and long-term estrogen supplementation to postmenopausal women elevated growth hormone concentration by 1.8 to 3.3 fold, and tandermal estrogen therapy is less active. <clears throat> while progestin devoid of androgenic properties did not interfere with IGF-1 hepatic synthesis. And then I would like to put your attention also on another aspect. When you speak about uh, the aspect of these hormones, such growth hormone and IGF-1, they are also acting on metabolism. And then uh, when you speak about the premenopausal chronological aging, the reduction in IGF a signaling reduces the glucose metabolism, giving a reduction in glucose uptake and glycolysis, then erase the chronic low-grade inflammation with increases in FKB activation in TNF and other uh, cytokines. We have, risparmio batteria attivo. We have, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we have uh, an increase in innate immunity response with microglial priming and astrocyte activation with an increase of interleukin-1 and interleukin-8. And uh, in postmenopausal endocrine endocrinological aging, where we have not only the HF1 signaling reduction, but also the reduction of AMPK and reduction in glucose metabolism, which reduces glucose uptake, glycolysis, and OXPOS, we have an increase in, uh, an increase in ketone bodies metabolism, an increase in peroxide production and lipid peroxidation, with uh, an increase in, cito in cyclo oxygenase activity in FKXB and an increase in, in reactivity of microglia and astrocyte with peripheral T cell mediated autoimmunity increase and increases in interleukin 8 and TNF alpha. And going on in postmenopausal aging, where you have, in addition to the reduction of IGF1 signaling and glucose metabolism, you have an increase in fatty acid beta oxidation, who bring an oxidative stress, increases of frost production, of, uh, of uh, peroxide production, of lipid peroxidation, and myelin debris. This is also associated to an increase in type 1 and 2 interferon response and microglia phagocytic senescence. And then you can see that these effects are not minimal. These effects are of fundamental importance in the aging process. And then I would like to mention you also what happened in the in the brain uh, in the brain glucose metabolism. In fact, yeah, you can see the beautiful picture. We put together premenopausal uh, uh, chronological aging, the effect of perimenopausal endocrinological aging, and postmenopausal chronological aging. You can see how the glucose metabolism is going down, how the fatty acid beta oxidation rises in perimenopause and remain high, how innate uh, immune responses increases and remain high and how the adaptive immune response increases. These are very important phenomena of aging process. And then uh, speaking about the neuroendocrinology or production now in another area, concerning the regulation of the body weight, this is depending to what happened in lateral hypothalamus where feeding centers are present in comparison to ventromedial nucleus where society centers are present and the changes in serotonin, beta endorphin, noradrenaline, NPY, and dopamine are dependent of these changes. The, and these changes bring to the fact that we have an important change in visceral adiposity during perimenopausal transition and early postmenopause, with no so much increases in abdominal subcutaneous tissue, but increases in visceral adipose tissue, while you have, in fact, no important changes in the total body weight and in the total content of body fat but it's the visceral adipose tissue who increases, increasing the cardiovascular risk. Then going now to the last part of my talk is the melatonin system impairment. You know, perimenopause is characterized by some 
depression and some primary sleep disorder. This is the characteristic. And Professor Milevich was telling you that melatonin is linked to sleeping capacity. And then you can see in premenopause, you have the primary sleep disorder. In perimenopause, vasomotor symptoms develop with mood swing and depression. And in postmenopause, we have the age-related sleep disorder and depression. And this, uh, you can see that increases sleep disturbances increase in postmenopausal women in comparison to the premenopausal. And this is associated by the increased incidence of sleep disorder, of sleep apnea, and the use of sleeping pills. And <clears throat> sleep disturbances are also linked to the flushes in middle women. Uh, sleep disturbances are common and may be multifactorial. They can be associated with aging, as I've mentioned, I also with primary sleep disorder associated to menopause transition to the vasomotor symptoms, mostly to the intensity, to the anxiety and depressive disorder. And they can be, have there are some comorbid medical conditions and medication, and also some psychosocial and behavioral factors who happen in their life at the time, you know. Sleep disorder in midlife women should be treated because substantial improvement in quality of life and health outcomes are achievable by the treatment of sleep disorder. And then you have uh, also, it was an interesting study done <clears throat> and recently published in 2022 on the chronotype and sleep quality in obesity. How do they, do they change after menopause? Eh? And in the summary, the author concluded in the management of postmenopausal women, especially those experiencing obesity, careful assessment of sleep disturbances and chronotype and subsequent development of the most appropriate treatment, including nutritional management, should be part of the, of the treatment routine. And you can see here that they clearly associate the fact that the environmental factors, such as lifestyle and obesity, such visceral adiposity, together with the decline of estrogen, and decline of melatonin and the increasing cortisol that I have already mentioned before, they are the major cause of the sleep disturbances with reduced sleep duration, early awakening, who changes the morning chronotype of the individual. And as you know, the chronotype is fundamental for the life extension, for the duration of life. Then, dear friend, I think the menopause can cause frailty, vulnerability, diseases, sleep disorders, changes in lifestyle, loss of sexuality. And the solution is all together, it's not one. It's estradiol, it's progesterone, it's DHEA sulfate, and it's also melatonin. And the intervention they have to be done by that way, and the optimal time of intervention is at the beginning, because you remind that age is the most important risk factor for age-related disease. Age-related multimorbidity impacts on healthcare cost and quality of life. The common mechanism of aging underpins age-related disease, and intervention targeting those mechanisms may delay the onset of multimorbidity. You can see here, oxidative uh, aging is something. The multi-system loss is another something. The single morbidity are another point. But when we have accelerated incidence of multimorbidity, the adverse outcomes are terrible. And then the optimal time for intervention is before the beginning or just at the beginning of the symptom. And the, and the actor in our scenario are estradiol, progesterone, DHEA, and melatonin. I thank you very much. And then, dear friends, I will go now to the question. Please write your question and we will answer. Okay, we have a first question from Alina Urbanovic. Dear Professor oh. Milevis, thank you very much for the informative lecture and support to Ukraine. I'm sorry, it's not a question, it's a declaration of love to Ukraine and to Professor Milevich. I thank you, Andrei, for your question. Then no, that's, uh, that's our feeling. I know that you are also singing like myself. <laughs> Then we have another question from an anonymous. What kind of melatonin dose you recommend for the management of sleep disorder in child, in children and adolescents? So I uh, can't use the melatonin in children. So I can start with small dose, like one uh, milligram, and then so it depends of how it works. So every uh, four weeks 
for, I can start with one milligram for four weeks. If it's not works, then so after two, I can increase the dose to two milligram for two next two weeks and then to, to set three milligram, but not a bigger dose in, in children. According to the adult people, I can start with three milligram in the bad time yes. for uh, four weeks if it's not works and every two weeks I increase the dose for 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 three milligram but not higher than nine milligram finally per 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 per, per, per day uh, I think it, it can it, it works uh, especially in, in uh, for, for uh, I can recommend for people who have really a uh, problem with uh, sleep disorders then, then I would like to ask you. I will add that. Like and then you continue with the same dose. Or, yes. And when you reduce or you decide to. So if the dose is uh, sufficient and you are satisfied for your sleep, so it continues because okay. it's not toxic and it's that effective dose and uh, it's okay. Then this is important, you know. Professor Milevi tell you this is not toxic. That once that you have defined the good dose, you can continue in the time. Yeah. And then I will answer to Michelle Moreau and one of our friends. She asked, androgen supplementation and the menopause is controversial. The same with the effect of estrogen supplementation to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Your opinion. Okay, Michelle, my opinion is that one, we have to measure androgen. Androgen are very easily evaluable. You can measure DHA sulfate. This is what I am normally using. Or also you can measure DHA, better DHA sulfate. My in the individual who have reduced concentration of DHA or sulfate in comparison to what expected for their age, and this included that yet the age in, uh, is associated with a progressive progressive decline. If they have even lower concentration, I think it's uh, it's right to start uh, an androgen supplementation that I do with DHA twenty five milligram a day in the morning evaluating later on the HEA sulfate and metabolite testosterone after the first six months of treatment. And then we have, uh, <coughs> oh, uh, okay. Then uh, Elena Rota, still always on melatonin, Andre, she asked, yeah. how administrate melatonin? Is necessary to measure melatonin before? Yes, so uh, it's a, it, uh, we have a routine method for the estimation of melatonin in salvia now. It says uh, routinely keep and so then you can estimate the levels uh, in, and depend of the uh, level of melatonin, uh, depend of age, your, uh, your age, um, so you can start with treatment. We can we can not only in blood, but it's not aggressive method to, to estimate it in salvia. But what is very important that the levels in salvia are three times lower in comparison to the levels in plasma. And uh, and then Elena Rota, she always asks, uh, and which is the cutoff of melatonin? Whew. <laughs> I don't. I, I must to come back to my slides because I don't <laughs> remember. I'm sorry for that. I, I hope that you noticed during my presentation. Thank you. And then and then Christina Tanase Damian, your melatonin presentation was very attractive. Eh? She asked why melatonin for adolescent, but I also would like to add why for adults. But please, can you? Give no, no. It's a, it's a it's a it's several paper. I was also surprised, but when I come to the literature, I, I noticed many, many publications which show that melatonin can be helpful for teenagers with sleep disorders. We can start to use melatonin in the bedtime with small dose, as I mentioned you before, and it's helpful. It's uh, it works. I don't know. I don't have personal experience, but on the basis of literature, it can be helpful. And uh, in adult people, it's uh, it's uh, normally because if I show you the uh, 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 the curve of uh, melatonin um, in adult people 
during the day and night, the levels of melatonin between day and night is very negligible. It's not physiological as we can expect it during the, our uh, adult time when it's a typical peak during the night. And then for that reason, so we must rebuild this peak using Thank the melatonin. Thank you. Then I will answer to Maria Escobar. She asked, uh, which supplementation would you choose in a patient with breast cancer history or risk? Okay. This, uh, if you believe uh, supplementation uh, because uh, that patient have uh, menopausal symptoms uh, or uh, climateric symptoms, I think, you know, in patient with uh, already a high risk of breast cancer is we have a contraindication to the administration of estrogen and progestogen together. Because as you know, estrogen cannot be given in a woman with a uterus without progesterone. Proge because progesterone and progestogen mostly seems to be the major factor of risk for breast cancer, not so much estrogen. But I would like to go in another point. You can give a supplementation with DHEA because uh, until now, all the data are in favor that DHEA is neutral for the breast and androgens in general are reducing the incidence of the disease. Then I think I would like to go better with, uh, with that one in comparison to an administration of uh, estoprogestin therapy. And then, uh, uh, then we, we have uh, still, uh, Still uh, uh, a nice uh, question from Maria Escobar, who we'll make the compliments for the presentation. Thank you, Maria. And uh, she is asking to you, Andre, because you have more experience in the class. Yes. What do you think about so many more cases of premature puberty in girls in pandemia years? Do you find a connection of juvenile hormone secretions? Uh, I, I find the relation to endocrine disruptors. Uh, probably, uh, if, uh, because uh, we contacted uh, last uh, many years with uh, endocrine disruptors in cosmetic, in food, and uh, every, every everywhere, and because they have the uh, hormonal activity, so they can disturb um, the uh, 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 physiological relation between. Uh, hormones in our in our body, and for that reason, I think that's the cause of the increased uh, levels of, of this, uh, um, especially endocrine disorders. Thank you very much. And then I will answer to the question of Christina Tanase Damian, and at the same time to Elena Rota. Christina asked, "What DHA does for menopausal women?" And <clears throat> Elena Rota, "Why is not commercialized as other hormone therapies?" And then, first of all, it's not commercialized by the major in pharma industries, but it's very well commercialized by a lot of producers and uh, by the by internet. And uh, I think the dose in menopausal women that we normally start is 25 milligram DHEA orally in the morning. But you have to take an attention. All the women are different. And some who had polycystic ovary syndrome, who have acne or who have symptoms of hyperandrogenism, you, uh, you have to start with a smaller dose, no more than 10 milligram a day, because they can have an hypersense local sensitivity and an increase at local transformation to more active androgen. Then my suggestion is 25 normally. We have, we check after six months uh, the levels of the HA sulfate, but in women who had hyper and who suffer of hyperandrogeny, then you have to start uh, with a smaller dose. And then another question, uh, Oh, okay. another question, Andre, for you. Does estrogen increase growth hormone secretion? Uh, yes. So the estrogen uh, appears to stimulate growth hormone secretion by um, uh, decreasing the liver secretion of IGF-1, uh, resulting in stimulation of the, P, uh, of the pituitary synthesis and secretion of growth hormone. And uh, especially uh, uh, if we use estrogen orally, so they stimulate the higher amount of uh, growth hormone. 
And uh, for that reason, so we can expect it's a different results in comparison to transdermal estrogen, which not stimulate such a high amount of growth hormone production like oral. Then I will answer to Christina Danase Damian. She put another question, very attractive. Uh, so far, a woman with breast cancer before who would like to have an IVF treatment with a side donor, no lenseto and utrogestan for her. No, no, it's absolutely not true. You know, uh, we, uh, the pregnancy after a breast cancer, a breast cancer well treated and it's not a contraindication to a, pre to a, to a follow to a pregnancy after that. Only is a contraindication if the breast cancer is still existing and eh, present. Then the small amount of estrogen given with a lenceto and the small amount of progesterone with utrogestan, they are nothing in comparison to the 30 nanogram of estradiol that she will have at the end of the pregnancy and 150, 180 nanograms of progesterone at the end of the pregnancy. Then you can absolutely, if she has the clinical condition to face a possible pregnancy, absolutely no problem in using, uh, in giving a stimulation uh, uh, with an administration of uh, lenseto of some amount of estradiol and uh, oral or vaginal progesterone. And then, uh, okay, and then is uh, another question, Andre, for you yes. from an anonymous. What about the use of melatonin in girl? or adolescent with central nervous system disability? So uh, according to the positive influence of melatonin for such a case, is a, if, um, is a, is a symptom like depression. So I think that it, uh, we, can, we can easy to, to, to try to, to use uh, and, uh, the, and we can expect it um, in, uh, not Probably not in all cases, but we can expect it some um, uh, some some uh, positive effect. I think so that we we can we can try to do uh, because it's much more safety like to use um, uh, 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 psychotrop psychotropic uh, drugs which have some metabolic disorders and uh, create and as uh, other complication problems. I totally agree. And then I will answer <clears throat> to Maria Alejandra Martinez. She asked uh, our opinions for a subdermal androgen supplementation in the menopause, which are not available in Argentina. They are also not available in Italy. They are mostly available only in some counties, and I have no personal experience. But I remember a very good friend uh, of us uh, uh, from England who they are widely using subdermal androgen administration in proper dose for female, in proper dose for female. And then we have also another question. Echo. Uh, another question, I will put that one to Professor Milevich, even though I can answer, is uh, can you recommend the HEA supplementation in women with premature ovarian failure? Uh, so, I, 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 of course, I, I, I will do, especially if they have the lower levels of DHA or DHA sulfate, if you estimate it. So, it makes sense absolutely to, to support because, uh, as we know, say it don't have the only uh, estrogen deficiency, but also androgen and it's a, a weak androgenic activity, but it still works. So it uh, can be helpful and safety okay. because it's not stimulated breast cancer as we remember Labri yes. show us uh, these results. Yes, and this is the men. reason why I, I am also using us uh, for uh, as uh, treatment in patients yes. who have already breast cancer. And then I would like to answer to that anonymous uh, participant, which substitution do you recommend for women over 60 who have already undergone estrogen progesterone replacement therapy for five, 10 years, but to have many problems even in postmenopause? I will continue. There are no data, no data in the world showing that continuing treatment. I have plenty of patients over 80 and over 90 who are still continuing. Certainly with a regimen, with reducing the dose, not needing menstruation, absolutely, but we maintain estrogen progesterone administration and we maintain also the HEA administration. In those yeah. patients, we reduce the doses. We reduce the doses, but we still maintain. I think it's this that, you know, we have to stop the treatment when the patient wants to stop the treatment. Then yeah. you have not to. Yeah, but 
but you can maintain the treatment until she perceives the benefit of the treatment. Yeah. Then, dear friends, we are approaching to the end. I have, oh, uh, will you perform me in a, uh, what follow-up? Okay, concerning the follow-up in a patient under DHEA, we measure DHEA sulfate, estradiol, testosterone, after, after more or less every year, once every year, and also, but also we make a normal check of all the life, of all the vital function. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I don't choose the DHA. The DHA can be chosen rather than menopausal, than, than um, other menopausal treatment in patients who don't want to use normal classical hormonal therapy. Otherwise, we can combine all together. Then we are at the end, we have still more than 140 participants. And I would like to ask Professor Milevich to give its final statement about the importance to evaluate the juvenile hormones in the young individuals until the menopause. And then I will give you also my view for the patients after the menopause. Please, Andre. So, uh, in my opinion, so is it, uh, as, as I show you during my presentation, as a juvenile hormone, especially melatonin, DHA, um, uh, growth hormone, and uh, estradiol play a very important role in, in um, uh, during <coughs> the, uh, uh, girl's life and also during, uh, as I say, uh, change. Um, and start to be women from from the stages of girls, and uh, so uh, we must uh, uh, remember that uh, uh, that uh, sometimes uh, the uh, the different uh, levels of uh, one of these four hormones uh, not mean uh, pathological stages because. Oops, Physiologically, sometimes they are uh, presented a higher level or lower, <clears throat> but we must remember about the stage of uh, uh, puberty, um, uh, like uh, which is a tunnel a stage of which tunnel uh, stage, and also um, um, uh, we must remember about the other disease like uh, hypothyroidism, what is very very often happens, especially in uh, when uh, they start to be adult. Uh, um, uh, girls, and for that uh, reason, I um, recommend you the supplementation by juvenile hormone. Uh, for sure, not like in adult women or aging women. Uh, so, so, uh, so uh, as, as a supplement for 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 young the part of our life, but I recommend the juvenile hormone as a treatment for the pathological situation. Uh, when, uh, for example, it's low levels of estradiol because of hyperplactinemia. Of course, we can treat hyperplactinemia. <clears throat> not, uh, 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 and then so we can expect uh, that estradiol increase. And the same story happened uh, when we uh, have uh, uh, gross hormone deficiency, so we must start with uh, treatment of with gross hormone. Then, so we can expect it now, uh, that uh, these uh, uh, girls in, uh, 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 have a normal childhood and and uh, and adult adult uh, adulthood, and um, uh, for that reason, so uh, uh, I think that uh, that. Uh, you uh, you must decide this as a as a doctor uh, in which situation you must start with medicine and in which situation you must just observe the uh, the patient and uh, uh, and uh, uh, in if it's uh, the situation is uh, you observe for a long stay so then so you, you can start with some um, uh, uh, bigger uh, uh, more precise di diagnosis and eventual treatment and then i would like to give you my answer you know aging is aging and it's written we have to die at the end but the aging is different from individual to individual and we have seen that all those who maintain for longer time 
those that uh, uh, Andre described as juvenile hormones, they have a healthier and longer life. Then this is the reason why I, I suggest to activate in since the perimenopause, a hormone replacement therapy. And then since the perimenopause and even earlier, an evaluation of uh, um, the lack of the of delta-5 androgens in women and then to give a DHEA supplementation. I would like to tell you also, now we had the terrible history of Women Health Initiative. We have stopped and blocked the utilization of hormone replacement therapy in women for 20 years. And we are now plenty of women who are already 10 years, 15 years after the menopause, who have still a lot of symptoms and still they are trying to counteract the anti-aging, the, the aging evolution, the, the evolution through, through the aging. And then in this, I suggest, if in the other, I suggest to start early with hormone replacement therapy and to take care also of the circulating the HA sulfate and then the endocrine supplementation, but in those who by the WHI, by the personal fear, by the fear of the doctors to give them that uh, uh, a normal replacement therapy, I suggest that you can start with the HA supplementation because no data show that you can, that is any risk at any age. And in addition, to a local therapies also with estrogen, also with DHEA, a local therapy to maintain the biology of the genitalia. I think that the genitourinary syndrome of the menopause, which is one complication of the elderly population, can be very well treated by a local administration of uh, local DHEA and estrogen. And in general, you can maintain the support for the woman who they have not done hormone replacement therapy if they are systematic activating the DHEA administration. Dear friends, thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today. It was a, a fantastic experience with Andre Milevich to speak about juvenile hormones high for, all, for elderly population and for women crossing through menopausal transition to the menopause and from Andre for young children, adolescents and, uh, and adult women in their fertile life. I think uh, I would like to invite all of you to join us for the next event of the European Society of Gynecology. It will be also a fantastic presence of an Italian speaker, Alessandro Genazzani, my brother from Modena, professor of gynecological endocrinology, and from and Blase uh, uh, Meskakalski from Poznan, then still a Polish Italian duo <laughs> about uh, the functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. Wednesday, 17th of May at three o'clock Central European time. We are expecting all of you. And I thank again Andrei Milevich. And I remind to you that we have the 15th Congress of the European Society of Gynecology in Amsterdam will be on, will be on site, but also available online from 29th of November to the 2nd of December. You can have all the information going on our website ESG2023.com. We wait you in Amsterdam and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Andre. Have a good day. Enjoy the life. All my regards to your family. Thank you. The same to you. <laughs> See you bye soon bye. in thank Florence. You. Thank you to all of you.